Aha, there we go. Okay, um, here we are. So thank you everybody. So my name is Lucky Singh and I'm the client relationship manager here at King's Business School. Um, and I oversee the recruitment and admission side of things for our executive education programs. Joining me today is my colleague, Dr. Mark LePere, who is our lead in ESG and sustainability. Um, and Mark teaches across a range of our programs, including our ESG programs and our executive MBA program. So I'm gonna hand over to Mark um, very shortly to take you through the taster session, um, and I'll come back during the Q&A. Um, if you have any questions, please pop it into the Q&A box, and then we'll answer those um, in a little while. Um, and yeah, I think um, that's everything. Uh, over to you, Mark. Great, thanks, Lucky. Hi, everybody, thank you for coming. Um, what I thought we'd do, if this is okay by way of an agenda, is we'll quickly talk about what ESG is, why it's relevant now, um, how ESG works. In other words, how is it designed, this new? It's particularly about regulations and how are they designed to work? And therefore, how does it affect you? Um, it's all underpinned, some of you may know this, some of you may not, by actually a new set of accounting standards, which I'm calling the new accounting normal. Um, we then have a slide just to let you know what we're doing at King's Business School in terms of uh, executive education courses. Um, and then we'll have a good long session on Q&A, which hopefully will be useful. And we're probably aiming to finish up at about five to one, if that's good for everybody. OK, does that sound good as an agenda? I can't see you, as I say, but Lucky will tell me if you're all thumbs down and saying, no, 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 that looks rubbish. So I'm assuming we're good to go. OK, um, so the first thing, often the best way to define something ironically is to say what it's not. And I think this is a useful place to start. Um, we've all heard of corporate social responsibility or CSR, and I think there is a, you know, possibly a default temptation to think that, oh, it's just the latest version of this. We've had triple bottom line and corporate purpose and stakeholder capitalism and shared value. And there's been lots of these words and phrases bandied around. CSR has been the longest um, running. It's been going around since about the 70s. And it's the blue line on this graph. You can see that it's kind of trickling along at quite a high level of, of um, Google searches, which is all this graph represents. But you can see immediately that there is a red line, i.e. ESG is not the same thing, both as a search term, but also conceptually. And the real difference conceptually is that CSR was an entirely voluntary exercise. ESG, by comparison, started off as being voluntary, but is now moving into a mandatory phase. It's what I call ESG 2.0. And that's what I'm going to focus on because that's where we are today and where it has the most impact on, on us all. And um, so in terms of what it is, let me just touch, uh, go backwards slightly for you. It started in 2004 as a concept, as a framework. These three elements of environmental, social and governance were brought together, mainly by a group of investors under the auspices of the UN. And they produced a report called Who Cares Wins. And really the report did two key things. It said that um, these factors or things to do in these kind of buckets, if you like, are material to company value, both in terms of equity value, but also performance in terms of profit and loss. And that they're material in the medium to longer term, so three to five years and 10 years and onwards, rather than what the world it still is doing very much, which is annual and quarterly reporting. So there's a slightly different time frame, which is important to keep in mind. But essentially, that's where the report stopped pretty much. And if I go back, you can see there that not a lot happened from the left hand side of the graph, the red line tooted along the bottom, not a lot happened till around the middle of the graph there, roughly over the keys. And it, um, you can see there it started to really pick up. And that's because largely the EU introduced some pretty significant regulation for large companies, still voluntary at this stage, but the beginning of it. And you can see the effect immediately. Ever since then, the regulation has been planned, discussed and starting to be executed. And you can see the line lifting accordingly. So what's involved are essentially, this is a pretty good mix of um, some environmental, social and governance measures. I'll just touch on them on them briefly. This is by no means a full set, but I think it's a pretty good core set. Um, it's from my own research, actually, and it's been mapped against the 
EU, uh, EU taxonomy, which is a set of 21 metrics that large companies and big financial institutions now have to use. And it's a pretty good set of core metrics that works for, I would say, most businesses. Obviously, there are specific industry things that go on top of this and are layered on top. But this is a, it's a good starting point. And um, so the important thing, first of all, is to say that carbon emissions, obviously a very hot topic, understandably for political reasons. It's got good leverage with the electorate. We all care deeply, etc. But it is by no means the only environmental one, let alone the only metric. So there's a temptation in ESG or sustainability to think, oh, it's just about carbon and the climate. And it really isn't. So here we're looking at things like renewable energy, waste recycling is a very big issue linked to that recyclable packaging. Water usage is a really big issue um, for the UN. They've got a target to reduce water by 2030, which is very significant in large parts of the world. Obviously, energy efficient vehicles coming in linked to carbon. And um, so let's not get fixated on carbon. It is wider than that. And for many businesses, not on this chart, but biodiversity is a really important one as well, particularly if you're in the building industries or hoteliers or in, uh, you know anything using um, anything using the built environment, essentially, you will be having an impact on 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 biodiversity. The social uh, metrics in the middle really come down to at the top employees and at the bottom customers. So roughly split halfway. Obviously, you're looking at things like jobs created, which is good for the economy. What are those salaries and wages? What are the work packages really like? Is it fair pay for fair work? Looking at very um, widely reported things around gender and ethnic diversity, pay gaps forever in the news, both between the most senior paid people in the company and the average employee, and critically between male and female employees. And then generally the area of employee support and training. Are people given the right tools to do the job, really? Um, and then below that, as I say, we're more into the customer side and we're looking at customer complaints really as a proxy for the quality of the products and services that we're delivering. Um, data security, obviously a really big issue and going to keep growing going forward. Uh, responsible marketing as an indicator of, again, how do we treat people? Are we, um, frankly, consciously lying to them or are we trying to be responsible? Um, and then product and service quality speaks for itself. The governance side of all of this relates to really the degree to which we are accountable to our lenders, investors, society at large. So you're looking at things like, are there are the external advisors to the company truly independent? And are they really external? Um, board diversity on the uh, gender diversity on the board, obviously very important. It's all very well having a board, but do they actually come to, to board meetings? Is attendance good? Um, what are the ethics of the company? Do they just think about sustainability? And essentially it's a checkbox, checkbox exercise at the board meeting, or is it, demonstrably a factor in their decision making. And then these two at the end are added in because of the EU regulation, um, which are to do with anti-slavery and whistleblowing. So as I say, it's not a full set. It's a pretty good core set and a good place to start, I think. Why is it relevant now? And as I've mentioned several times, it's really because new regulation is coming into a force. It's been on, it's coming into effect. It's been on the books for some time. Um, all of it, I should say, is a journey. It's all starting now and will be built on sequentially over the next three, four, five years. And all the big um, economies of the world, pretty much, obviously they're not all on this slide, but um, the European Commission are probably in the lead, Europe, um, in terms of the standards and where they've got to so far. Britain announced a COP26 last year, it's um, rules and regulations. Some of that is beginning to come into effect. Already large companies in Britain have to report um, on their transition planning uh, under the thing called the TCFD, which is to do with planning for climate change effectively. Um, and there's more and more being built. There's new rules around investment product labeling coming in this summer, for instance. In America, the Securities and Exchange Commission are active also. They are publishing their first standards very soon, imminently. And um, China have their own, and there's 40 other countries around the world, all looking in this area. At, at 40 by the last count, sorry, and not just countries, jurisdictions. So, for instance, um, the African Union came on board last October and decided they were 
getting involved in this and issuing their standards, etc. So it really is a worldwide effort. A colleague of ours in the law school, Megan, um, has done this very impressive report, really and identifying what she calls a coordinated and networked ecosystem of regulators and standard setters. And that's very unusual, not only that they're talking to each other, frankly, within country, but also they're very deliberately talking to, other, to each other across country. And this makes huge sense when you think about it, that the whole concept started and was driven by investors. So the capital markets are global. Naturally, if we're going to start measuring this kind of, you know, the kind of metrics we looked at, then we need to do it in terms of um, its applicability around the world and its comparability around the world. It's what they call a global baseline, is what the um, effort um, at the moment is, is aiming to, to, um, to create. Unsurprisingly also, if it is investor based, which it is, that it is all underpinned by a new type of accounting. And the IFRS will be familiar, I hope, to many of you. It's the International Financial Reporting Standards. They are responsible for what we all know and love, the financial reporting um, under a thing called the IASB. And last in November 2021, they set up this thing called the ISSB, which, as you see, stands for International Sustainability Standards Board. So this is to measure, if you like, non-financial data of the type that we just looked at. And the aim, as I say, is to make this comparable and consistent with the rigor and the discipline and the professionalism of financial reporting. It's not going to happen immediately, obviously, but that is the aim. And it is going to happen. It's going to start happening as of this June when the ISSB released their first set of standards. So we're off on the journey. The direction of travel is pretty clear, I believe. It is, if you like, I actually think of it as up to now, for right or wrong, we've measured half of the company the financial half, and we've not really measured properly the non-financial half. And really ESG, one, one interpretation of it is that it's an invitation to measure the whole company. Okay, um, now how it works is the reason it affects you in the way it does right now. So depending on the size of the business, most regulation now is aiming at large companies. At the moment, it's companies typically in Europe and the UK of about 500 employees or more, and you have certain revenue thresholds, but let's just stay with employees. 500 employees or more um, and financial institutions, okay, the large institution or the other banks, the asset managers, etc. Um, and that's where this voluntary EU regulation started back in 2018, um, as I mentioned. Already, the next generation of corporate stuff is coming, is going to affect companies of 250 employees or more. So you can see it's gradually working down through the size of company. And ultimately, all companies, including small and medium sized enterprises, SMEs or SMBs, as sometimes they're referred to, will also almost certainly have to report on this stuff, much like they do on financial uh, reporting. They'll probably have a light version of it. So Reporting accounts for small companies is a relatively small summary document, whereas for a large company, it's like war and peace, it's huge. Something similar is going to pan out over the next three, four, five years. In the meantime, though, all companies are already being drawn into this, uh, into this field and, and into this non-financial reporting and thinking about it and collecting the data. And here's the reason why. Just let's stay with carbon just for a moment. Carbon has three what they call scopes or types of emissions. The first is scope one, which is what we directly emit when we burn fuel ourselves. So in a in a boiler. Um, the second one is what they call scope two, which are the emissions I buy in. So I'm buying in emissions through my electricity or my gas supplier. OK, and scope three are the emissions that I somehow am involved with because I'm part of a supply chain. So I have goods, maybe packaging, whatever coming into me. I do what I do with my products and then I send it out by, say, courier to the 
to the retailers, or even if I'm an online business, I'm using couriers to deliver my product to the end consumer. So I have an incoming and an outgoing in my supply chain. And the regulation requires me to measure my scopes one, two, and three emissions in all those, um, it, all the way through that value chain. And that's true whether I am a financial institution or a company. So what we're looking at here is um, the main, the major regulators, as I discussed at the top. They are working with the new accounting standards, which I'll come back to in a minute on the left. And they are doing it all because of all of our expectations. You know, we want companies to be doing this. We want governments to be doing this. We want people, we want ourselves to be doing it. We want people to take notice of this and to do something about it. And that's really what the regulation is trying to do. So if we just focus in for a minute. Investors, lenders on the left hand side there are the financial institutions that currently, as of January this year, now have to report in Europe under something called the SFDR. And that behoves them to use this set of metrics called the EU taxonomy, very similar to the ones we looked at at the beginning, and to report on scope one, two and three. That means if they invest in a company, however small, that company's scope three emissions are part of what they have to disclose back up the line to the regulator. If, if I'm a bank and I lend money to a small business or a, a medium sized business or a large business, whatever their emissions are in scope three are part of my scope three emissions. So they have to come all the way back up to me and then the bank has to report them as their emissions because they are their scope. They are their scope three emissions. So um, th this idea of value chains is what I'm trying to get across. And obviously on the corporate side on the right, that applies more obviously, I guess, where you have, we're all used to the idea of supply chains. So if I'm selling sandwiches to a big company or I'm renting a fleet of vehicles to a company, the, our, my emissions are part of their emissions that they have to report. So that's why we're all getting drawn into this now. And with a, in, a, in a different exercise, I'm running a, a, an ongoing piece of research where every company I speak to, I say, are you receiving these requests now from companies, banks, investors right now asking you for your CO2 emissions, your gender, your pay gaps, your inclusivity, your diversity, that kind of thing. And it's currently running at 63%. So even though it's not mandatory yet for smaller businesses, it will become so. And it is already mandatory, as I said, for companies of 500 or more right now. And in two years time of 250 or more, if you do business in the European area. So although we've left Europe, um, if you do business in the European economic area, you have to fulfill these metrics. If you're American, Singapore, Chinese, doesn't matter where your head office is, if you do business in the European area, you have to report on this stuff for companies of 250 or more. So you can see that it really is going to draw us all in pretty quickly. I mean, I hope that makes sense and help, helps everyone understand it a bit better. I mentioned this idea of the new accounting normal. It's a really simple idea. And if you go back to this idea that somehow with our over the past 50 years, since the early to mid 70s, we really have focused in accounting terms almost exclusively on money. At the expense, really, of the environment and many would argue society. And so although we talk about employees and we measure various things to do with employees and customers and all kinds of things, we don't really equate them to financial reporting. Financial reporting has been pretty much everything. And so this is an effort to what I call measure the forgotten side of the business, i.e. the reasons, the inputs to the ability to make money, which are employees, goods and services, our use of raw materials, natural materials, etc. And that's what this new body, the ISSB, that we touched on is writing the standards to help everybody do it in a comparable way and to create this global baseline. What they're going to ask to do is to, and the regulation will, will soon require, that both sets of data are put into a single report that's called an integrated report, okay? Which makes huge sense, and it's probably a bit small on the screen, so forgive me, but let me just very quickly give you the theory of it, because I think the theory is simple and, and, and actually interesting and worth, worth touching on. Essentially, the model of integrated reporting says that an enterprise, a business, a company, an organization has six capitals that it uses 
to create um, wealth. So the first is financial capital, manufactured capital, intellectual capital, human capital, social and relationship capital, so goodwill, reputation, all that stuff, and natural capital, obviously, things like air, water, biodiversity, etc. And essentially the model says we take the stock of those capitals at the beginning of any financial year, we run them through the business model in the middle, and at the end of the year we see whether each capital has gone up or down essentially in terms of its stock. So that's the core Pretty simple model, but it's pretty powerful because it remembers the forgotten side of the company. Um, and the advantage of this, and of course, why investors want it and why lenders want it, and why ultimately, I personally believe that it's in the best interest of companies to do this. I know many companies right now are going, oh, it's an extra burden, it's compliance, it's extra cost, we don't need it. But truthfully, if you start to measure this stuff well, and to the high accounting level standards, then what you can do is you can link these kind of ESG impacts, if you will, to the profit and loss account. And then you can start to do some really interesting things. You can say, oh, I see. So if we do hit our net zero targets by 2030, we'll have actually saved this much money. If I reduce my staff turnover, maybe by paying a bit more or giving better crash facilities or faster computers, I can almost certainly reduce my cost of losing staff and you can put a value on that, a proper value on it. Um, you know, if I don't have any independent directors, almost certainly in the future, my cost of borrowing will go up because I'll do poorly on ESG. So you can see how these things, you start to look at the whole company in an integrated fashion. Um, so I hope that, uh, I think rather than stop, I think we should go on. I'll just finish these couple of slides, if that's okay. And then, um, Please answer me any questions we've got. I don't know, Lucky, if you're there still. And do we have any yeah. questions that have come in so far? No questions, but we did have a couple of people join, um, right. you know, 10 minutes, 15 minutes in. Um, okay. So it might be that they'll ask you some stuff that you've covered, but that's fine. Well, well, that's fine. And you're very welcome. And thank you for coming. Right. So I'll just touch on this stuff because I think it's, again, hopefully helpful. Um, and then we can get into the questions. So. King's famously in the business school doesn't do normal MBAs because we felt that it was um, really it was a training for people who just want it, it had become a training largely for people who just want to go into financial services. And we decided to focus on the undergraduate market and the educate the executive market, which we're now really kind of kind of building up. So let me just touch on some of the courses that are open to you and hopefully you'll be interested in some of them and um, working from left to right. We have two open courses. Uh, they're open to anybody, all managers and leaders. It would make sense for them to, to attend if they wish. And um, the first on the left there is a three day course. It's this idea that we can move and we need to move beyond compliance. ESG, sustainable business, whatever you want to call it, is not just an exercise in, in box ticking. I know there are debates around this and I'll touch on it in a moment, in fact, but Truthfully, the value to the business lies in getting beyond that and to see it as an opportunity to create value and opportunity. And that's really what the course is about. So our aim really in the course and hopefully what you get out of it is to make a real impact on, on yourself, on your organization and on turn on the world. The second level of that is really it's kind of the same thing, but more designed for SMEs. So smaller companies, 10 to 250 employees, it's a half day course and it's really aimed at the founders and the managers um, and really it's to show them that there is a way of what we could say here unlocking the value it's the same kind of idea there is a value in all of this sustainable business and it's to help them unlock it and uh, moving into the more substantive courses then we have custom learning so we work with several industries and indeed organizations you know big companies to work specifically in partnership with them to solve specific needs and challenges that they have. And to do this, we bring in um, sector experts within the business school, but outside the business school. So for instance, uh, my friend my friend Megan, who I mentioned earlier on, she would obviously play a leading role in anything to do with the law, um, anything to do with regulation, you know, that side of things. If we're looking at the environmental side, particularly, we can talk to our geographers, our war studies experts, et cetera. So we'll bring in people from around 
the entire university as required. So it's pretty powerful um, when it's used. As I say, we're, we're already working with several industries and organizations. Well, several, lots. The tip of the iceberg is the King's Executive MBA. And we are launching that in uh, November, um, October, September. September, Lucky? Uh, yes. Yes. September this year is the first cohort. Um, and the idea very much is to, if you are or your company thinks you are, a C-suite, a leader of tomorrow, a CEO, a CFO, a chief marketing, a chief strategy officer, whatever it may be, this course is designed to equip you in this new era to meet these new challenges that we haven't really faced before together. And it's a it's a 21 month course. It's taught in four day blocks, which take place every two months. So it starts in September. Um, I'm then teaching the first kind of on site block in November. So it's four days, Friday to Monday, take very little time off work. It's very intense, very good fun. And then you get some work to do in between, but not that much. And then you come back for another four day block. So it, 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 it's cleverly designed. And the idea really is to give you the skills and the network to balance this idea of profit and purpose. So you really can lead your organization into a brighter future when you when you get into a position to do that. Um, broadly speaking, I'm just going to take three minutes on this and then we're going to stop for questions is um, really what we're trying to do in all of these courses is to invite people and all of you here on the call to take your places somewhere on this spectrum from left to right. There are people out there who will just go and they're, I guess, most famously in America <laughs> at the moment. They are just rejecting all of this. It's all, you know, climate change is a hoax. I don't believe it. This is all rubbish. It's woke. It's the current um, thing that's being said in America and they just reject it. Others resist it. Um, you know, why do I have to do this? It's silly. We should just be about making money, et cetera, et cetera. Either way, those people will have to do something because the regulation will apply to them. So there is a compliance requirement, even if you're on the left of the dotted line. Hopefully, people will gradually move to the right and you move. Some people will be at the reluctant stage. You know, well, I get it. It's not really my problem. Our business isn't really that bad of an emitter and we do try and pay our people well, et cetera, et cetera. It's maybe a bit overkill for me, but I kind of understand, you know, that kind of attitude. So they're what we're terming the reluctant. And then there are the people who really can get excited about this. And I, I hands up, I'm one of them. Um, if you think about the opportunity that we have now, the, the requirement that we have to literally re-engineer the planet, from a business systems point of view, a financial system point of view, a political system point of view, a cultural system, all the systems of the world really need to be re-engineered and reinvented over the next five, 10, 20 years and beyond. And that's arguably one of the most exciting and largest growth opportunities business has ever seen. So I think there is a way of thinking about this as entrepreneurship rather than just compliance and the school We'll teach you how to do the, our courses will teach you how to do the compliance, but we will focus more, as you might imagine, on the entrepreneurship side of this. And um, just two quick thoughts on entrepreneurship first. Um, there's two real theories of entrepreneurship. You may be familiar with them. Um, one is the famous one by Schumpeter called creative destruction. And it's the idea that new things destroy old things that are redundant. And then you get this constant um, cycle of creativity, essentially. The other definition though is quite different, and it comes from um, an economist called Peter Drucker, a, a, a management professor, and he had this idea that really entrepreneurship is the exploitation of opportunity. And what I find is quite interesting, whichever of these definitions you're more, more drawn to, I'm not sure it really matters because the challenges that inequalities of wealth and all the other inequalities that um, assert, that are associated with that, like education, opportunity, sanitation, hygiene, etc. They all are screaming at us, along with climate change and earth system change and biodiversity loss, to say, we need a new model. We need some creative destruction here. The other side of it is you can say, well, actually, as I've just said, these are, represent huge opportunities so we can exploit them. So either way, we at the school would like, I personally would like to see this and try and encourage people to see it as 
yes, it's a crisis in many ways, certainly the climate crisis is, um, but actually it's an opportunity for entrepreneurship. So that's just an interesting aside on that. Lastly, I've touched on this before, this idea of measuring the forgotten side of production and wealth, I think is very interesting. Most of you will be familiar with, or at least have heard of the work of Adam Smith way back in 1776, very much cited as the godfather, the founder, if you will, of, of modern economics. And this was his original model of labor, land and capital. They were the ingredients, they were the factors of production and wealth. And as I say, really, for whatever reasons, and we can go into those on one of these courses, obviously on all these courses, for some reason, we've decided to focus just on capital money and only in the last 50 years. So it hasn't always been this way. And now we basically need to start counting in again, labor and land to a much greater degree than we ever have. And that's really, if you think about it, what this ESG stuff, sustainable business impact, whatever, as I say, the words aren't terribly important. That's really what it's aimed at. Um, we teach you to learn, hopefully, how to spot things like greenwashing, bluewashing, hushwashing. You saw that on the invitation. Very quickly, greenwashing is the policy by companies to frankly claim much better green cr credentials than is the reality of their business operations. And unfortunately, in the mandatory world of ESG, in the voluntary world of ESG, that has become commonplace. It's the predominant version. It's, it's, it's a marketing exercise. And that's hugely part of why the regulation is coming in. And you may have noticed it on the slide there. Every regulator has said their main aim is to combat greenwashing. One of their main aims is to combat, to counter. They use different words, but it's the same thing, to counter greenwashing. And just on that, it's very interesting that the regulators are not the Environmental Protection Agency in America or the Welfare Office here in Britain. They are the central bankers, the financial regulators. So you saw on the slide is the Securities and Exchange Commission in America, right? not the EPA. It's the Financial Conduct Authority in Britain, okay, et cetera, working with their colleagues in the accounting profession, as we said. So it is this idea of it being valuable and it being costed and it being accounted for and linked to money is crucial behind all this. Just quickly on blue washing, that is a lot of you will have seen or know of the sustainable development goals came out of the UN um, and there's a lot of use of them in, in marketing and by companies and sometimes it's good and sometimes it's bad. There's quite a lot of leaps of faith. So we make chocolate bars, therefore we're helping to solve world hunger. Hmm. That's quite a big gap between cause and effect and it could well be that the way you make the chocolate bars actually is causing more world hunger rather than less. So there's quite a lot of blue washing, blue obviously being the color of the UN. And then hush washing is the latest thing, which is really, maybe if we don't tell anybody, nobody will notice and we'll get away with it. And that's harder, obviously, in the social media world. But it's again why the regulations are forcing this disclosure. Um, very quickly, and then I'm into q and I just thought this was interesting since we were talking about it. Very good example of greenwashing. A lot of us will have heard of carbon offsets. Uh, a lot of, I was flying back at the weekend from, from um, Toulouse in France and British Airways offered me, do I want to spend £2.50, which would go to, to offset my carbon, apparently, to go towards planting some, some saplings, some potential trees? Um, my answer, you can imagine what it was. But um, interestingly, in The Guardian last week, I don't know if any of you saw it, The Guardian, uh, there is the, the gold standard for um, these schemes, which have been backed by large businesses to the huge degrees, like Shell are going to be spending 450 million pounds this year, supposedly on planting forests. What they're actually buying is tiny little saplings, which may or may not grow. And this latest research revealed that actually 90% of them are actually um, fraudulent and they don't even exist. So it's very interesting research. It's a great example of greenwashing. Um, and you compare that on the other side to people really putting up huge amounts of money to incentivize um, people to switch, for instance, to net zero by 2030, 2040, whatever it may be. And here's an example of Barclays putting a trillion dollars up for lending, for what they call transition lending for good purposes by 2030. So I hope the balance is tipping, but that gives you an example of both. Okay. I hope that's useful. I'll 
stop sharing. We can always go back to sharing if, if someone has questions and I need the slides, but I hope that was helpful. Great, thanks, Mark. Um, no, that was that was great. Um, we have some questions that have come through in the chat, um, so we can answer those. Emiliano, yes. Um, so if you have any questions you want to ask live, just raise your hand, um, and then Mark and I will just um, I'll ask you to unmute. Um, so yes, thanks, Mark. So we have our first question from Deborah, um, and Deborah has asked, how much will graduate job opportunities in ESG grow over the next five years? What professional career advice would you give to a current KBS student, either UG or PG? Um, good question, Deborah. I, on the quantum, I can't give you a, a hard and fast answer. What I would say is that um, I hope it's pretty clear, and it's pretty clear to me. I, admittedly, I've been studying it for five or six years now, but it's pretty clear that sustainability is going to become the, and I don't just mean the environment, I mean all of it, is going to become the lens through which pretty much everything in the world is going to be viewed. And that's going to be of necessity. Um, and so I think to study anything in this area is going to command a premium against whatever the normal rate would have been had that not been the case. So I, I always liken it to until probably some business schools were still even doing it just before COVID, we were teaching business and then there was there used to be modules in this thing called the digital transformation do everybody remember that i mean and now to do to pretend that the digital transformation is somehow separate and not right at the heart of business is a bit laughable because it's it's look at us today <laughs> we couldn't be having this meeting so sustainability is going to become like that it's going to become not just front and center it's going to become the lens so marketing will have to be reinterpreted through sustainability. Finance, we've just been talking about that. Um, everything will be reinterpreted through this lens. So I think people with real skills, current skills, it's all being, it's all new to everybody. There's nobody out there who has all the answers. Everyone's learning together. So I think current skills, keeping up to date, making sure your skills are um, relevant and you really do know what's going on. I think that's going to be really important and we'll definitely command higher prices. Lucky you're on mute. Thanks, Mark. Um, Emiliano, go ahead. You can unmute yourself. Thanks, Lucky, and thanks, Mark, for the great talk. Um, it's very useful. Um, I know this is a taster session, but there's one specific part of um, uh, the discussion earlier that's interesting to me as uh, it links with some of the research I did uh, during my master's at King's College just last year. And it's um, regarding sort of the pollution haven hypothesis and that multinationals will move part of their operations to uh, jurisdictions with less stringent um, environmental regulations. So I guess my question here links to the discussion about scope three emissions and mm -hmm. how um, you know, uh, the European Union, the UK, the US becoming more and more stringent on um, disclosing every part of your uh, of your supply chain. How does how do the two how do those two topics sort of go hand in hand on, on the one side? You might con you might think multinationals will continue to move even more of their operations abroad uh, to less stringent economies or vice versa, that they may wish to bring more back uh, into the uh, areas with more stringent regulations so that they can reduce their scope three emissions. Uh, apologies if that's a bit long, but uh, no, I, I, no, I, it's it's really good, Emiliano. Good. Um, a lot of people get confused, not confused. A lot of people quite rightly ask, isn't there confusion around this scope three stuff? And there is, as, as you'll have learned. It's um, the truth is scope one, frankly, are the real direct emissions that a business is putting up there because they're the things we're burning. That's the fuel we're using. Scope two is the indirect. So that's get scope three is harder to measure. There's definitely double counting in scope three, but it's not really it's not really the core focus. It's more of an attempt to say this company in going about in going about its work has this broader impact. Um, so, for instance, it's particularly important when you look at the social side and you're looking at sweatshops and all that those working practices and things. So um, 
scope three, I think we should separate scope one and two from scope three is is is, is really what I'm trying to say. Um, and I think there are there will be that there is this problem of uh, pollution havens. Um, I think there's two mechanisms that are being created that we are aiming to offset that or to, to get around that. One is um, Europe, you probably study this, are bringing in something called a carbon border adjustment mechanism, sorry, the cross border adjustment mechanism for carbon. And the idea essentially is if European companies have to report and adhere to higher standards, then it's not fair that people could import from a pollution haven at a lower price and undercut them. So those importers will now have to pay, in effect, a duty for which will bring effectively the two up to a similar standard. So that's coming in. Um, it starts now. Companies have to register and the first payments will be made in 2026. So that's an immediate um, attempt by the regulators to block that, if you know, this idea of, of pollution haven straight away. Ultimately, I, I don't think it can be that long until carbon pricing comes in, which is a combination of tax, removing subsidies. It's quite complicated, but essentially that's almost certainly going to come in as well. So um, there'd be two immediate answers. I mean, in the short term, will there be some arbitrage? There probably will. I think, again, think about this idea of the global baseline, the, the regulation, they are working together. The EU, for instance, are talking to the Chinese on what they call universal common standards. So, uh, uh, sorry, a universal common taxonomy. So the idea of worldwide metrics, if you like. So there is a, there is an unprecedented amount of um, networking and coordination, and it is designed to stop exactly what you're talking about. But will it be instant? No, uh, I don't think it'd be too long though. Thank you very uh, much. That's, uh, that's very insightful. Um, yeah, especially the sort of global standards will be interesting to see how did how they reach those agreements. Yeah, um, but yeah, yeah, thank you very much. Thanks. Anyone else? Any questions on the courses or? No. All good. For those of you who came late, did you? Was it okay? You caught up okay? You didn't miss anything? Everyone happy? You're on mute, Babita. I can't, we can't, yep, don't worry. Uh, thank you, Mark, and thank you, Lucky. I missed a couple of uh, initial slides. So last, uh, I, I am not able to connect the what happened in the beginning, but uh, I am interested to know about in detail about the module. Uh, on the website, the seven, eight, uh, uh, pointers are there, but I'm not able to uh, go through all the details. Can I have that by any means by the email? Which, which module are you talking about, Babita? The overall the courses. Oh, overall, there was one slide which had all the courses on it. Yeah. Um, Lucky, what's the best thing to do? You're on mute too. You're on mute too. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, Babita, what I'll do is I'll share um, the content with you separately. Um, and then we can have a one-to-one -one consultation as well, um, just to go into yeah, that. That would be, in more that'd be uh, helpful, yes. yes. But is there anything in particular that you're interested in, in in the ESG space while we've got Mark on the on the call? Is there anything that you're, you know, that you're mostly interested in or you want to explore? Uh, regarding the courses? Yes. Uh, actually, I have not gone through the module. I have to look That's because fine. I'm coming through the very hardcore research background. I need to look the the detail about the module, whether uh, how I am connecting my prior uh, experience with the, this is more towards the business oriented. So uh, it would be a good idea to first go through the module then. Yeah. When you say the module, just to be clear, they are separate courses. So there are no. open courses, tailored courses, and then the EMBA, which is the executive MBA, which has eight modules. Yes, the one year program, yes. No, so there isn't a one-year program. There's a three-day program, there's a half-day program, and there's a two-year program. The executive MBA is a two-year program. No, it I takes think... place over 21 months. Uh, I think there is a one-year program. I wonder, are you talking about the strategic MBA in the 
as at the master at the MSc level. Is that what you're talking? Yes. Ah, okay. So Lucky can help you there. It's a different yeah. program. Yeah. Yes. Okay. It's the master's level. So we're talking an executive MBA versus the MSc. Okay. Good. So uh, at the moment, in the I'm in a uh, wrong meeting group or something. No. 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 Don't worry. But there are two different courses. That's all. Yeah. You're talking about a different one. That's fine. That's good. Deborah okay. Is, Deborah is asked, um, will any of our courses offer opportunities to engage with employers looking to fill ESG positions? Yeah, um, definitely. The the Frankly, I said earlier on that we're all learning together and that's very much what the courses are designed to do. So they're very interactive. There's a lot of um, group work, pairs, working in pairs, individual exercises, all that. Um, so you will be learning from your from your from your peers, um, and really our job is to guide the conversation and to steer it. Um, but specifically, the executive MBA, if that's appropriate for you, I don't know. Um, that does have a, a lot. We get a lot of guest speakers in, as indeed we do, even on the open courses. We do involve guest speakers a lot um, because you're right. Case studies, real experience in the field, as it were, is really really important. So that's, I mean, that's common of all courses that we run, you know, we do, we do like, we have a lot of uh, relationships with external companies and individuals who we bring in to bring these things to life really, yes. In terms of working in a company, that's more, I think going to be the, that's not so much the executive education because they've all got jobs. It's more in the MSc that, um, Mabita was talking about, which is a master's level. It's not quite the same as the executive MBA. You, the executive MBA is a you need to work for, I think, 10 years. Yes. Um, so so they're quite different things. But but there is I know there's some in employee stuff available there. Yeah. Mark, you mentioned um, that there are some organizations like Barclays who are doing a, you know, doing a good job in terms of the ESG space. Um, I is didn't say that. I, I don't know whether they're doing a good job. What I said is they're putting up a lot of money to yeah. subsidize um, what they call transition lending to encourage companies okay. to switch to more carbon, ultimately to get to net zero. Are there any role models that you you think we could be taking some uh, advice from or looking at um, to kind of within organizations to um, to kind of take any any learnings from them? Do you mean in terms of companies or people? Companies. It's difficult. I think, um, to be honest, I think like individuals, I think what's interesting about this area is the temptation is to think of it as in a binary way. I'm good or bad. I'm right or wrong. And like everything in life, that's not the case. Um, I was doing a podcast in America some time ago and I found myself saying to the guy, and it, it, was, it was a true story, I was rinsing a yogurt pot at home um, and I suddenly realised that, because I wanted to recycle it, and I suddenly realised that I had inadvertently turned on the hot tap rather than the cold tap. And I suddenly thought, oh, hang on a minute, I wonder, am I doing more harm by using the hot water than I am good by recycling the yogurt pot? I mean, it, it's just a good illustration, and I think that's true for everybody in our lives and yeah. for companies. So I don't think there's anybody doing anything right or anything wrong. I think the game and what we're all striving towards is to get to a net balance position where we're going on balance. It's more good than bad, put it that way. And certainly when it comes to carbon emissions, greenhouse gas emissions, I should say more correctly, we need to get to this idea of net zero. Um, so I, I, think th I think that's a really important piece of the conversation, actually. It's a good, yeah, it's a good, thank you, Lucky. No, thanks, Mark. Okay. Um, so any other questions? Okay, well, it's been very nice chatting to you all. Thank you very much for coming. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope it was useful. Um, Lucky will be there to answer any one-to-ones or specific course questions you have. And um, very nice to meet you all. Thanks, Mark. No, it was, it was a really great session. It was really insightful. Thank you so much for your time. Um, and thank you everyone for joining. Um, as mentioned, you'll have the recording. And if you have any questions, please just email us at execed-business at kcl.ac.uk. Um, and we can also have a one-to-one -one consultation with you about our courses, but also um, you know, about this area and topic as well. So um, 
please do get in touch uh, if you have any any questions. Um, yes, and Deborah was saying thank you. So um, yes, thank you everyone and speak to you soon.